15. Gold and Dross. W. Hen I met Now Cow's cousin and his family at the Lee's apartment. There was, of course, one child who was not playing games with her newfound cousins or sitting on the doorstep and watching the cars drive down East 12th Street in the spring twilight, the hour the Lees still called pig feeding time. Leah was on her mother's back, swaddled in a bright pink Nias, an apron-shaped baby carrier that Fu had embroidered with black, yellow, and green cross-stitching and ornamented with 18 fuzzy pink pom-poms. It was perhaps the largest Nias in Hmong history. Since Liao was more than 3 feet tall and weighed 36 pounds, Fu preferred it to the pediatric wheelchair, provided by the Merced County Health Department, that sat in a corner of the living room. A shawl was wrapped around them both, and from a distance, because Leah's body lay stiff and motionless against her mother's. They looked like a single person. Liao was almost seven. For more than two years, her doctors had been waiting for her to die and her parents had been confounding them with their ability to keep her alive. Although Lia was not dead, she was quadriplegic, spastic, incontinent, and incapable of purposeful movement. Her condition was termed a persistent vegetative state. Most of the time her arms were drawn up tightly against her chest, and her fists were clenched, a sign of cerebral motor damage. Sometimes her legs trembled. Sometimes her head nodded. Not in jerks, but slowly as if she were assenting to a question underwater. Sometimes she moaned or whimpered. She continued to breathe, swallow, sleep, wake, sneeze, snore, grunt, and cry, because those functions were governed by her unimpaired brainstem, but she had no self-aware mental activity, a function governed by the forebrain. Her most conspicuously aberrant feature was her eyes, which, although clear, Sometimes stared blankly and sometimes darted to one side as if she were frightened. Looking at her, I could not help feeling that something was missing beyond the neurotransmissive capabilities of her cerebral cortex, and that her parents' name for it, her plague, or soul, was as good a term as any. I once said to Terry Hutchison, Leah's neurologist at Valley Children's Hospital in Fresno, but she must have some consciousness. She can cry, and when her mother picks her up and rocks her, she stops. Doctor, Hutchison replied. Well, you take a Venus flytrap. Does it decide to snap at a fly that is walking on its pod? Or does it just do it? I think it just does it. Leah is like a flytrap. It's all reflex. Nevertheless, I do believe, even though there is no way you can ask people like that how they feel, that it is at least theoretically possible for her to have no thoughts, no memories, no conscious life and yet respond to her mother's touch. I asked Leah's parents what they thought their daughter could sense. Now Kao said, when we hold her, she knows it and is smiling. Fua said, sometimes when I call her, it seems that she does recognize me, but I don't really know, because it seems that Leah cannot see me. My baby hasn't done anything bad. She is a good girl, but because she is hurt like this it is just as if she is dead. Every day now, she cannot see me. On December 9, 1986, Leah had returned home from MCMC with a fever of 104 degrees, an irregular breathing pattern, an inability to cough up or swallow her own secretions, and a prognosis of imminent death. Within days, her temperature was normal, her breathing was regular, and her swallowing and gag reflexes were back, scratching their heads. Her doctors attributed these improvements to reduced swelling in the medulla and hypothalamus. Her parents attributed them to the herbal infusion with which they had bathed their daughter when she first came home, and for many days thereafter, they'd put a shower curtain on the living room floor and Lelia on it, recalled Janine Hilt. Fua would drench her in this tea remedy that she had cooked up, just sponging it all over her body and her hair and her head. It was really quite a soothing thing, a loving thing. During Leah's first days home, Janine had visited the Lees every day. It was because of her that Fua and now Kao left the hated nasogastric tube, which they had been directed to use for the remainder of Leah's life, in place for an entire week. Under Janine's guidance, they poured two ounces of infant formula down the tube every two hours, checking its placement by injecting air through a syringe and listening for the bubbles. Through a stethoscope, it was really slow, recalled now Kao, and I didn't really know how to use it. That tube had two plastic things, and if the food gets stuck in there, then you can't feed anymore. 
Finally they yanked it out of Leah's nose and started squeezing formula into her mouth with a baby bottle. This worked perfectly, even though the doctors had predicted that without the tube Leah would choke to death. The only problem was that because the prescribed tube was no longer being used. Medi-Cal refused to pay for the formula. So Neil and Peggy started giving the family entire cases of Similac with iron, intended to be dispensed as free samples to new mothers. Medi-Cal was willing to pay for a wheelchair and a suction machine, but it drew the line at a pediatric hospital bed. This bed, which the Lees had never requested, became the focal point toward which all of Janine's grief and rage about Leah's condition converged. When Medi-Cal said they wouldn't pay for it, it just pissed me off to the max. She said. Some all-powerful doctor in the regional bureau said the monks sleep on the floor anyway so they didn't need it. He was a real racist and I told him so. I just went crazy. Berserk. I started calling a million and one places. Finally I got a medical supply company I found in the yellow pages to provide a brand new bed and deliver it to the Lee's home. Completely free. Janine never found out that Leah did not sleep in this bed, which stood for years next to her parents' double bed, taking up space in their tiny bedroom. Leah always sleeps with us, Fua told me. She is the only child who sleeps in our bed. I hold her during the night and we pat her feet all night long because we love her so much. If you don't pat Leah on her foot or her knee, she cries a lot. The first time Leah returned to the clinic for a checkup, Neil was on duty. During her last stay at MCMC, he had so successfully distanced himself from her case that although he had seen Leah, he had not seen Fu and now Cao since their daughter's return from Fresno. Years later, when he looked through Leah's medical chart, he paused for a long time when he came to the clinic note from that visit. I wondered what he found so emotionally compelling about. Today, Leah is afebrile with a temperature of 98, 3 degrees axillary, weight 42 pounds and hemoglobin is 11. He cleared his throat. That first visit was a very significant visit for me. He said. It was very emotional. I remember Janine Hilt was in the room too. Also an interpreter. I remember talking to the mother and saying it was very hard for me to see Leah the way she was. To actually be in the same room with her. And that what had happened was something. I had always feared. And that I was very sorry. And what absolutely blew me away is that I. Well, I was afraid they were going to blame me for what happened. But the mother showed me compassion. She understood, somehow she got the heishi. Well, Neil was scrabbling uncomfortably for words. But he was determined to forge ahead, well. I think part of it was that I was crying. What she did was. She thanked me. And she hugged me. And I hugged her. He cleared. His throat again. So anyway. When I asked Fu about that encounter. All she said was. Leah's doctor really hurt for her. Now Kao scowled and remained silent. He had never stopped being angry at MCMC and everyone who worked there. Fua, temperamentally more accommodating than her husband, had managed to divert all her blame to the doctors in Fresno who had given Leah too much medicine, thereby partially exonerating Neil and Peggy. In her eyes, the husband and wife doctors were guilty not of the mortal sin of destroying her daughter but of the lesser sin. A sin of omission, of going on vacation and leaving Leah in the wrong hands. As the months passed, Leah became, in some cockeyed sense, a radiantly vital child. Although every page of her chart contained the notation, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, static, irreparable brain damage, one clinic report also noted. Problem. Seizure disorder. On Depakine resolved. NBSP. Problem. Obesity resolved. In other words, Leah's brain damage had cured her epilepsy. And, over time, as she grew taller, or rather, longer, since she never stood again, her obligatory soft food diet cured her obesity. She was real healthy, said Peggy, with jaunty sarcasm. She was the healthiest she'd ever been. She was just perfect. A perfect vegetable. Suddenly, Leah was, as Bill Selvage once told me dryly, just, the sort of patient nurses like. She had metamorphosed from a hyperactive child with a frightening seizure disorder and inaccessible veins into an inert, uncomplaining body who would probably never need another for. Simultaneously, in the eyes of the family practice staff, her parents were miraculously transformed from child abusers to model caregivers. Teresa Callahan, a resident who had seen Leah during both phases, told me, 
her mom and dad must have taken wonderful care of her because she grew so much. Most kids that are that severely gorked sort of shrivel up and turn into a bag of bones. I've seen 17-year-olds who were the size of 4-year-olds, Neil said, whenever they brought her into the clinic in that baby carrier. Leah was always well-groomed, well-dressed, and immaculate. Just immaculate. It was very impressive, Peggy added. They did a better job than most white families. Most white families would institutionalize her in a second. Fu and Nao Kao could never figure out why the clinic staff treated them so much better than the hospital staff ever had. From their point of view, their daughter had changed utterly, but their behavior as parents had not changed in the slightest. The only explanation Nao Kao could come up with was, Lia doesn't go to the bathroom very often, so she is clean and that is why they like her. When I heard him ascribe Lia's newfound popularity to her constipation, I was reminded of the comment he had once made when I told him I would like to visit Laos someday. Having taken due note of America's obsession with technology and hygiene, he said, You wouldn't like it. There are no cars. But you would think Chiang Mai in Thailand is very nice. When I asked why, he said, Because it has a lot of garbage collectors. Now that anti convulsants were no longer prescribed and compliance was no longer an issue, Merced's doctors, nurses, CPS workers, public health workers, and juvenile court officers, the clamorous army of authority figures who had been telling the Lees for four years that they were not taking good care of their daughter, suddenly fell silent. On March 5, 1987, the Lees' probationary status as Leah's guardians, which had been in effect since their daughter was released from foster care, was lifted. In the matter of Lia Lee, a dependent child of the juvenile court, the Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Merced declared. Whereas, it now appears to the satisfaction of the court that it is for the best interests of the above-named minor that juvenile court jurisdiction be terminated. IT is hereby ordered that the order heretofore made by this court, a judging LIA Lee to be a dependent child of the juvenile court B, and the same is hereby vacated and set aside, and the said person is hereby released from the operation thereof. Fua and Nao Kao never trusted this document which of course they could not read and which in any case would be almost impossible to render in Hmong. They continued to fear that their daughter might once again be made government property. For several years, Fua, who never let herself forget that she had been visiting relatives, on the day Lia had been removed to foster care, stayed with her 24 hours a day to make sure she was not snatched by the police. If we allow, said Nao Kao, they probably would take her away again but we just love Lia too much and we don't want anybody to take her. My wife watches Lia every day, so they cannot take her. My wife would not let them. The anthropologist George M. Scott, Jr. has written that in Laos. Children were generally deeply adored. Even those with physical or mental deformities were showered with affection. Indeed, with even greater affection than normal children, which resulted in part from the belief that as with miscarriages and stillbirths, the deformity was the consequence of past transgressions on the part of the parents and thus must be born with equanimity and treated with kindness as means of expiation. Fu and Nao Kao were fairly sure, but not certain, that transgressions on the part of American doctors, not on their own part, were responsible for Leah's condition, but no expiatory motivation was needed. They showered Leah with affection because they could not imagine doing otherwise. They had always thought of her as an anointed one, a princess. Now, constantly attended by her parents and siblings, she had assumed a position in the family that was, if anything, even more regal. She was a central stillness around which the life of the family condensed. If she sat in her wheelchair, someone was always at her elbow. If she was strapped into a Naya's, her bearer, whether it was her mother, her father, or one of her older sisters, did a constant little swaying dance to soothe her. More photographs of her hung on the walls than of any of her eight siblings. For years, the schedule Janine had once written for her, wake up, meds, leave for school, playtime, continued to hang there too, even though she no longer took medicines, went to school, or played. Whether she still woke up in the morning was a question of semantics. Lia was the only Lee child who had birthday parties. Every July 19th. The sidewalk outside the East 12th Street apartment overflowed with relatives and Hmong children. Janine Hilt brought frisbees, beach balls, 
and water pistols. Fu served mung egg rolls stuffed with minced pork and onion, steamed bananas with rice, chickens that had been sacrificed that morning, and their skulls and tongues examined for divinatory signs, before they were stewed, and Doritos. There was always an American birthday cake. Janine lit the candles and cut the first piece. The guest of honor, of course, could not blow out her candles or eat her cake. She sat in her wheelchair, immobile and impassive, while the children, who had learned a standard repertoire of American songs in school, sang, Happy Birthday. Leah was still a beautiful child. She was nothing like the patients in vegetative states whom I had seen in hospitals. Pasty-skinned carcasses with slack mouths. Hair like straw. Bodies that smelled of urine even after they were bathed. Leah's black hair was still shiny. Her skin was soft and fine. Her lips were still pink and shaped like a cupid's bow. She smelled delicious. It therefore never seemed strange to me that her family treated her as one would an especially winsome baby. A diapered, bottle-fed, fussing baby who just happened to be three feet tall. Fu cuddled her, stroked her, rocked her, bounced her, sang to her, nuzzled her neck, inhaled her hair, played with her fingers, and made raspberry sounds against her belly. There were also times when Lia seemed more like a pet, a golden retriever, perhaps, with strokeable fur and a tractable disposition. Her younger sister Pang liked to give her bear hugs, tug her ears, and then, joined by Mai and True, lie on top of her in a heap, three squirming, giggling children and one silent one. In Laos, Fua had bathed her children on the dirt floor, using a small bowl to pour the stream water that she had warmed on the fire. Now she bathed Lia in the porcelain tub every day, on hot days. Twice. I usually get in with her. She said, because by the time I'm done I'm all wet anyway. After the bath, she bent and extended Leah's arms and legs, as a child would flex the limbs of a Barbie doll, in a series of range of motion exercises, taught her by the health department, that were intended to forestall permanent contractures. She fed Leah by spoon or from a six-ounce bottle with a broad, flat, easy-to-suck nipple designed for babies with cleft palates. A resident's note. From the MCMC clinic stated that parents feed her formula plus rice cereal. In fact, Leah also ate pork and chicken that her mother had ground to a fine consistency with the hand carved mortar and pestle she had brought from Laos. Sometimes Fu simply pre chewed the chicken, like a mother bird, and stuffed it into Leah's mouth. Every day Fu boiled quantities of a spinach like vegetable called Zob, which she grew specially for Leah in the parking lot, and fed her the broth. Leah usually straddled Fu's lap her long legs sticking out on either side. While Fua, after putting her lips to the food to make sure it wasn't too hot, coaxed tiny bites into her mouth, she always wiped Leah's drool with her hand rather than with a napkin or a towel. It takes a long time to eat, she told me once. As she fed Leah rice, you have to open Leah's mouth to look inside, because if there is already rice in there, and you put some more in, she might vomit it back out. You have to hold your hand in back of her neck all the time or she can't swallow. Then she laughed and kissed Leah's ricey mouth. Sometimes I thought, this is not so terrible. Leah lived at home, not in a chronic care facility. She was a love object, not a pariah. The Hmong community accepted her without reservation. Her mother was not suicidal, as she had been after Leah was placed in foster care. It was true that Fua and now Kao sometimes slighted her siblings, especially Pang who had never been allowed to assume her rightful place as the youngest and most coddled member of the family. When Pang was barely out of toddlerhood, she zoomed in and out of the apartment unsupervised, playing with plastic bags and, on occasion, with a large butcher knife. Still, none of the Lees, even the teenagers, ever seemed embarrassed by Leah, as most of the American children I knew might be, because Leah's continual epileptic crises were over. May, as the eldest daughter living at home, had been largely relieved of the pressures of serving as her parents' medical interpreter. I had to go with my parent to the hospital to translate, she wrote in her eighth grade autobiography. Speaking of the year after Leah's return from foster care, I never had my way out cause most of my cousin who my parent needed. The most are always busy doing this and that. I was like their translator everywhere they go, carrying her sister in Anaya's, feeding her formula and doing the family shopping at the Save Mart on J Street were far lighter responsibilities.
but whenever I began to be lulled by this relatively rosy picture, I was drawn up short by an explosion of rage from now cow, my child is lost because of those doctors. Or, more frequently, by a sudden seepage of grief from Fua. One minute Fua would be laughing, and the next she would be in tears. She would go for weeks without a word of complaint, and then exclaim, Lia is so heavy, she is so hard to carry. Other people see nice places, but I never can. She went for two years without sewing any pine top except Leah's giant Nias. Leah is too sick, she said. And I am too sad. I am so busy with Leah that I don't know anything except being alive. Once. I saw her rocking back and forth on her haunches. Keening. When I asked her what was the matter, she just said, I love Leah too much. A half-finished bottle of Depakine syrup which was no longer prescribed for Leah and which Neil and Peggy assumed had been thrown out long ago, continued to sit on a kitchen shelf for years. It was not there to be used. It was there because the American doctors had once considered it priceless. And discarding it would have been like tossing out a pile of foreign coins that were no longer negotiable but had not altogether shed their aura of value. Fu and now Cao treated Leah with what they called Hmong medicines. We can't give her any kind of medicine from the hospital. Now Cao explained. Because if we do, she gets really tense and her body twists into some kind of tight knot. They fed her teas made from powdered roots, imported from Thailand, which they bought at a Hmong owned market, and from herbs they grew for her in the parking lot a stainless steel mixing bowl, filled with sacred water and covered with two pieces of fringed paper, hung by a length of twine from the ceiling of their bedroom. Itsiv Neeb had placed it there as a lure for Leah's errant soul, about twice a year or more often if they could afford it. Atsiv Neeb came to their apartment to perform a pig sacrifice. For several weeks. Afterwards, Lia wore soul binding strings around her wrists. Because the detested anti-convulsants were no longer prescribed. And because Fu's feelings for Lia's doctors had become almost fond since the day she and Neil had hugged. They continued to carry Lia about once a year to the MCMC clinic. Though not to the hospital next door. Lia's problems, constipation conjunctivitis, pharyngitis, could now be dealt with on an outpatient basis. When Lia missed an appointment, the clinic's computer, fixed in its imperturbable bureaucratic groove, sent her this reminder. Dear Lia Li, on February 29th, 88 you had an appointment with Dr. Philp which you did not keep. Your physician feels that you should be seen. Please call the Merced Family Practice Center at 385. 7060 so that we can schedule another appointment for you. Leah never called. The Lee's most frequent encounters with Merced's medical establishment were now the checkups, first weekly, then monthly, then two or three times a year, performed by a public health nurse who, like at Siv Neeb, made house calls. The nurse was named Martin Kilgore. Martin was a large, kind, Eccentric man who was undoubtedly the only employee of the Merced County Health Department with an all-over tan, from vacationing at a nudist camp. His politics were liberal. His I. Q. As he once confided with a self-deprecating grin. Was 150. And his conversation was peppered with references to classical literature. He referred to Leah's daimon and her moira as often as to her hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Once he compared the relationship between the Lees and their medical providers to the myth of Sisyphus, the Corinthian king who attempted to cheat death by placing him in fetters. I mentioned Martin's analogy to Neil. He had never heard of Sisyphus. But when I described how the old reprobate had been condemned to roll a boulder up a hill over and over again, only to have it roll back down just before he reached the summit, Neil said, That's perfect. Later it occurred to me that although Neil instinctively identified with Sisyphus, the Lees would undoubtedly have maintained that they were the ones who had done the boulder pushing. Martin had first met Leah and her family in the spring of 1985, before she was placed in foster care. He had been sent to the Lee home to determine whether her parents were giving her the proper amounts of Tegretol and Phenobarbital. They weren't. Not knowing what he was in for, he wrote a note to MCMC that concluded. Thank you for this interesting referral, the sheaf of impeccably typed, formally phrased letters that he had since dispatched to Neil and Peggy documented, year by year, his own gallant efforts to roll the boulder up the hill, and the boulder's repeated descents. His main concern was now Leah's constipation. 
part of a generalized gastrointestinal slowdown caused by her neurological impairment. In February of 1988, when Leah's vegetative state had lasted for about a year, he informed Peggy that Elia continues to have impacted stools on a weekly basis. His next sentence was a model of repertorial tact. The mother states she is using Metamucil assiduously but their bottle is full and covered with dust. Martin once invited me to accompany him on one of his home visits. I was curious to see how he and the Lees dealt with each other. Since, unlike most of Merced's medical community, Martin was a vocal Hmong partisan. He had a clearer grasp of the Hmong role in the war in Laos than anyone else I met in Merced, and had written dozens of letters to local newspapers castigating the readers for their intolerance. One reader had been so angry he had threatened to blow Martin away with a shotgun causing Martin, for reasons more alphabetical than literary, to change his listing in the Merced telephone directory to Joyce Kilmer. Martin didn't dislike the Lees, or at least preferred them to some of his Caucasian clients, whose parenting skills he described as inferior to those of chimpanzees. He had so strongly disagreed with Neil's decision to place Leah with a foster family that, jettisoning all professional objectivity, he had once told Now Cow, Mr. Lee, in America we get lawyers when people do things like that. I figured that if anyone could communicate with the Lees, it would be Martin. When Martin and his interpreter Kua Her arrived at the Lees' apartment, Fua was kneeling on the floor, feeding Leah a bottle of water, and now Kao was sitting next to her with Pang on his lap. Hello Mr. Lee. Martin boomed. Now Kao focused on the wall-to-wall -wall carpet and said nothing. Martin lowered himself to the floor. Now, Mr. Lee. He said, what is your daughter eating? Is it mostly liquid? I realized, with surprise, that the Lees had never told him about the chicken and pork foot mashed with her mortar and pestle. Kua Her, a small, conscientious, self-effacing man, translated Martin's question in a scarcely audible voice, as he translated, or attempted, to translate, all of Martin's subsequent questions from English to Hmong, and the Lees' answers from Hmong to English. Fu mumbled something. She says it is very soft food, said Kua. Well, said Martin, empirically Lia is not gaining or losing weight. I can tell that whatever they are doing nutritionally is definitely all right. Without explaining what he was doing, he started to tickle Lia's feet. He noted her Babinski reflex. An extension of the big toe that signifies damage to the central nervous system. He then put his stethoscope against her abdomen. Lia started to howl like a wolf. Fua put her face next to Leah's and crooned. TCH. 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 I am listening for bowel sounds, said Martin. I hardly hear any bowel sound so now I am going to listen to her chest. Her lungs are good. Now, the last time I was here, I talked about why it would be nice if we could take her temperature. Every day. Just so we could find out if there is a problem coming up. Do they remember that? Kua said. She said. Yes. They do that. Every day. Martin looked pleased. And what is her usual temperature? She says 30 or 40. That stopped Martin momentarily. But he pressed on. Ah. Uh. Well. Let's move to the pulse. Then. He burrowed his finger between the soul binding strings on Leah's wrist. Now I'm counting her pulse. She has a pulse of 100. It is good if the mama can take her pulse every day. She says they don't know how to tell the pulse, said Kua. Well, you just put your finger here, and take your watch, and count for a minute. Fua didn't own a watch, nor did she know what a minute was. At this point, Pang, who was three at the time, ran over to Lia and started banging her on the chest. Don't do that, there's a good boy, said Martin, addressing the little girl in English, of which she did not speak a word, Kua. Please tell them they have got to watch these other little children. Lia is not a doll. He coughed. Now, let us proceed to elimination. Does Lia have a bowel movement by herself or do they have to give her a pill first? He was referring to the Dolcolax tablets that the Lees sometimes used. Like fast-acting antibiotics. Laxatives were acceptable to many Hmong because they worked quickly. Unambiguously. And without apparent side effects. She says they use the pill for it to come out. Well. It is really better not to use those pills on a regular basis. It would be better to give her fiber, in the form of Metamucil. Because if you keep using the medicine, then Lia will lose the ability to move her bowels by herself and she will always have to have the medicine. 
And that is a bad thing. When Kua translated this, Fua and Nao Kao stared at him. For four years, they had been told to give Lia medicine that they didn't want to give her. Now they were being told not to give her medicine that they did want to give her. I want to tell them the story of my grandfather, continued Martin. For the last 20 years of his life, he had to eat Epsom salts because he started using those laxatives and he couldn't stop. Do they know what Epsom salts are? Terrible looking stuff. Magnesium sulfate. Kua looked baffled. I'm not sure how he translated magnesium sulfate. So if I could send my spirit back in time to talk to my grandfather, I would say, Grandfather, don't start down that road. Take Metamucil, but don't put it in her formula. Okay. Formula is milk. And milk constipates people. You might as well feed her glue. They could try putting the Metamucil in a bottle of prune juice. Okay. Prune juice would unplug anything. That would be a real depth bomb. Do they know what prune juice is? They obviously didn't. And neither did Kua. When he reached that point in his translation, he simply inserted the English words, prune juice, into the middle of a long Hmong sentence. I preferred not even to imagine how he translated depth bomb. It is made out of plums, explained Martin. You take a plum and you dry it. Then you make juice out of it. I am going to write it down for them. So they can look for it in the store. And on a piece of yellow paper, in huge capital letters, he wrote, Prune juice. Now Cow took the piece of paper and looked at it blankly. Even if he had been able to read the words, he had no idea what a prune was. Now, Kua, said Martin, before we leave, I was just curious. I was noticing Lia has some bands on her wrists. And I was recently reading in a book about Hmong people and the Hmong religion. And, I wondered how did they explain what happened to Lia in terms of their religion. The Lee's faces closed as abruptly as a slammed door. He said they don't know anything about that, said Kua. I thought, but they just spent an hour the other night talking about how Dab steals souls. They would have gone on for another hour if Maying hadn't had to get home. What had come over them today? It seemed as if my open, animated, garrulous friends, faced with someone they viewed as an authority figure even though he would probably have quit his job before he ever treated them coercively, had entered a vegetative state themselves. They hadn't said twenty words since Martin arrived. They hadn't laughed, smiled, or looked him in the eye. And then I thought, these must be the people Neil and Peggy have been dealing with all these years. No wonder everyone but Janine thinks they are impenetrable and stupid. Of course, Martin had undergone an equally unseemly metamorphosis himself. From savant to bumbler, it was as if, by a process of reverse alchemy, each party in this doomed relationship had managed to convert the other's gold into dross. Well, said Martin, rising with difficulty from the floor, it looks as if that is the best we can do today. They have my card, which of course might as well have been written in cuneiform, and they should remember. I am here to help them. If you folks can get the prune juice, I would advise it. Goodbye, Mr. Lee. Goodbye, Mrs. Lee. As we walked to Martin's car, with Kua trailing silently ten paces behind, Martin frowned. He knew that the visit had gone badly, but he couldn't put his finger on why. Had he not been courteous? Had he not shown his respect for the Hmong culture by expressing an interest in the Lee's spiritual beliefs? Had he not refrained from criticizing them, even when he felt they were wrong? I gave them my full shot. He said, You saw how patiently I explained things to them. He sighed long and slow. I do the best I can. On some days I think of Leah as a character in a Greek tragedy. By Euripides. Perhaps. On other days, well. I just think about Metamucil. 